hear now from uh, our in-person tables and we will start with the in-person table from the topic you actually just heard the online version of which is the co-development triangle so this is Carlos so if you can I'll just turn on the video yeah if you can hold that yes hello yes yeah, so we had a couple of interesting discussion on this uh, co-development triangle um, I'll try to summarize some of the key points I guess the first one is that there are two conversations. One is science to science, and the other is science to user, so, so, so to speak. And the observation modeling interface is complex uh, and has not always worked, but it's way simpler than the interface between either of the two and the users. In terms of how to improve the interface, observation to model, uh, the, there was um, a suggestion um, emerging on, on uh, putting a focus on processes rather than thinking about modeling it itself or observation itself think about how can we improve our collective understanding of processes um, if you put in in the equation the users this being uh, policymakers at the unf triple c level or national level um, or, or anything else then the conversation i mean is, is a completely different game is really uh, and one of the issue is uh, the use of the language we are not speaking the same language and actually making sense of what of, even at the table it wasn't necessarily uh, straightforward um, one of the emerging uh, point there is the idea of embrace the co-development from the very beginning um, and that co-development can actually be quite daunting if you think in terms of satellite observation that have a long planning stage so how can you really keep the engagement uh, up and running um, uh, there is this uh, element that was also emerged and is the fact to bring up um, you know lift the, the general knowledge about um, observation and modeling within the users but there was also a feeling that this is a bit what they have to learn about our world and not as about their world, which is somehow an interesting asymmetry. So the B is a two-way street, really, that we need to, to work there. Um, I come to the recommendation because I'm running out of time, I realize. Um, well, there are some low-hanging fruit, um, and some of them have been already mentioned. So open data, standardization, standardization, standardization uh, to facilitate the uptake. Um, but also a workshop with the user, working and identify the champion users. Uh, the early adopter um, and funding on the interface uh, between observations, modeling, and users. Sorry if I missed some of the of the points. Thank you. Okay, so next we have um, topic one, which is the high resolution modeling with atmosphere. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, in the topic one, we uh, certainly, uh, first of all, discussed it and we realized we don't have so much time. Um, so we addressed a, a lot of different issues in terms of high resolution modeling. We, we thought it's, um, the first one was really to define what do we mean with high resolution modeling. Uh, we agreed then on one to three kilometers, maybe nine kilometers on that scale. And then we realized that in terms of observational point of view, we probably don't need every time the very high resolution 10 meter data because um, from the modeling point of view, it's often been looked for the, the larger scale patterns. Um, then we had the question and um, in terms of why do, we, um, die, why do we do high resolution modeling? And um, this is certainly because we wanted to resolve extremes. So which of course then poses the requirement or the demand for the high resolution observation as well that the observation shall be capture the observ the extremes in the observational data records placing quite a lot of demand on that um, then i think we heard that before somehow well i don't know so now it's better um, the excess of, of data is an issue um, the format the homogeneity of the data is an issue and the format of the data is an issue and um, combined uh, with the satellite observation to be done for the high resolution, we would also need, um, and that's I think also an important message to pass, uh, the reference networks shall be extended and not 
um, is smaller and should not be um, reduced like the ocean part. Okay. Wonderful. And now we hand over to the land table, high resolution modeling for land. All right. So I guess we also had a quite a fruitful discussion, but I, we try to aggregate it under two main points. So the first one would be on observations that could better represent the surface heterogeneity and that could then improve the land use schemes within the RCMs and GCMs, so uh, regional climate models and global climate models, especially on those convection permitting resolution. This would then affect those heat fluxes and also convection. There were a few actions that we uh, aggregated under this uh, bullet point. So we would have to look at the evaporation, um, the LST, and uh, water soil content. These were a few variables that we particularly discussed. And to also make sure that they go to these higher resolutions or to downscaling or to somehow capturing them on the higher resolutions. Also the seasonal skill we discussed would be important to further improve. And there was also suggested that we could do more uh, diagnostic studies, actually, to better understand the current problems of those models uh, with the observations that we're having. Then the second main bullet point that we discussed was uh, urban studies. Um, so here we said that it could be good to further develop those ECVs for urban context. And also we discussed the uh, emissivity data improvements. So how can we really go from those um, observations of emissivity to better incorporate them in more the really urban or city scale models? So we go down to even higher resolutions. And we also discussed if we can uh, combine this, for instance, with the wood up uh, approach. Um, here we also had, we touched up briefly on, uh, upon citizen science. So if they could also help to get those higher resolution observation, but there of course we need to safeguard um, the quality and also see how reliable those type of observations will be. So we discussed really briefly one kind of game changer. If we have unlimited funding. So we said, firstly, it would be great if we can downscale the observations um, to really high resolutions to overcome those technological challenges. But of course, if we would have really no, uh, no unlimited, like no limit to the funding, we would love to have those sensors on a meter scale resolution. And next we have the table that was looking at observations and reanalysis for model evaluation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm just going to focus on a couple of um, the, the ideas that we had, uh, which actually overlaps interestingly quite a lot with some of the stuff that we've already heard. Um, so the, so w one specific thing was uh, to focus the, um, essentially to focus on extremes um, and the idea of um, we really should be thinking in terms of using the very high resolution observations we have um, alongside the reanalyses to, to generate high, high resolution um, reanalyses and um, with the idea of something specific here uh, which would be um, to do that for tropical cyclones. Uh, so that could involve the use of a high resolution regional model for a regional reanalysis at sort of at the kilometer scale. And that could be something that could be done reasonably soon. Uh, it might be something that could be put on the radar of era seven. I know we haven't even got era six yet um, when they get down to the very high resolutions. Um, but obviously what this would require would be quite a lot of new infrastructure to be able to bring these these things together. But it would give us a really, really useful, useful data set because there's a lot of um, modeling that's going on at the kilometer scale now um, in uh, um, for um, improvements in representation of convection, but also for urban modeling. Um, and we really don't have the tools to be able to evaluate those models. So that was one one sort of one idea specifically focused on high resolution and, um, uh, and extremes. And the other one was basically to um, think about how we could improve the reanalysis to represent re representation of precipitation. Um, and one of the things that we could um, we, we could do there would be to have fully coupled and a proper specification of the relevant boundary conditions. So, for example, not so have um, time e time evolving high resolution land use going into the models, but then also having um, a, a coupled um, land and atmosphere. Um, data assimilation system, which would um, be at the heart of this um, this improved reanalysis. So that's those are our ideas. 
Super, thank you. And next we have feedback from the table as focused on a shared understanding of observational uncertainty. Thank you very much. So this is uh, quite a wide topic and it has been a lot of ideas. So actually it has been very difficult in such a short term to, to, make, a, um, to make a summary of this. So as a first idea, I think uh, we all agree that um, we need to uh, make available the uncertainty of the uh, of the of the data sets that we provide so the, the, this is quite basic to be used for all the different uh, communities so a uh, point so interesting discussion was about um, the definition of uncertainty so there are com different communities with different definition of uncertainty um, people that work with observations um, especially and, and even within the observation uh, for for people that work with satellites uh, uncertainty is different that uh, people will work with in situ um, stations so uh, that's completely different. So, uh, and for modelers, obviously, also there is a, an, another different uh, definition. So, we recommend from our table to have an exchange between all the different communities. This is in, a, in, in the in the form of a workshop or another. Um, we 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 don't know, but I think that's quite important to foster this um, uh, exchange between the various communities. And probably output of also of that exchange, um, we think that is important to, to, uh, to develop a set. So this is about the standardization. So developing a set of uh, definition of what exactly uncertainty means, um, uh, in terms of correlation length scales, uh, propagation of the different components of the error, different and different time and special scales, etc. cetera. Um, there is also an important need that we discuss about the the um, yeah to understand what the uncertainty means. So we see about or we're thinking about checking the the consistency between the the uncertainty of the observation and the model uncertainty and trying to understand really what is the origin of the uncertainty that, that we are uh, dealing with in the in the data sets. So. Uh, two very quick ideas before I finish. So one is about uh, uncertainty on the on the trends. So we are providing climate uh, climate uh, data records. We are looking at the trends. So we want to uh, develop these um, estimates, uh, the estimate the uncertainty of um, of these trends. And the second one is uh, the last one. I don't remember. Uh, so I think I will leave it there because I can't remember it. Wonderful. And this is the last table we're hearing back from, which was focused. No. Oh, second to last. Oops. Carbon cycle and carbon climate feedbacks. All right. Uh, well, for, first of all, the, the first feedback was that the actual format worked quite well. We had very good and intense discussions. And I would say that the uh, discussions aligned themselves in two distinct areas. One of them is uh, related to the Earth observation uh, carbon um, aspects. The fact that uh, there are a number of Earth observation carbon observatories coming or a, being developed or already in orbit. And uh, it would be very good if these uh, missions could be cross calibrated because at the fundamental level, there is a uh, trust in the data, trust in the, uh, in the measurements that are being made from space that needs to be uh, demonstrated, and especially as you work between uh, missions. Possibly on the longer term, an optimization of the carbon observing capabilities between agencies so that they work uh, in, a, in a good way together. Uh, the second uh, aspect was more related to the uh, climate aspects of carbon. Uh, a long, intense discussion again, uh, accompanied by a glass of wine, which helped a lot. Um, we had, uh, I would say, one of the dominating themes that came out was the pre predictability of the um, uh, climate models in terms of carbon, um, ways of um, assessing these. Uh, first of all, through uh, starting more or less now with a very um, a consistent and rigorous initialization and then uh, regional assessments over the coming 30 years to uh, to see how well these models uh, uh, are predicting what is actually happening. So you have to have the, the measurements and it provides uh, important feedback on how well you can predict. It's important in discussions with policymakers that you demonstrate that you can you can predict at least there's something. And and of course, uh, in areas where it doesn't work, it, to have the data and the and the um, how to say the efforts to try and understand why improvements of processes, improvements of or missing parameters, and that type of thing. So those were the two uh, two big aspects. Super, thank you. And this is the last table being reported back, which is the uh, achieving integrated and harmonised analysis ready data. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got three 
bullet points, a lot of overlap with what's already been reported from the other tables, which I think is probably a good, a good sign. So our first point is the standardisation. We thought a common vocabulary between uh, the producers and the users of the data uh, was really going to be the starting point. We need agreements on the standards and formats which have been discussed a lot, but also on how to find the data. So the searchability of the data, the APIs that may be different um, uh, people who are like Isa and Noah who are developing the data and their platforms use APIs and those aren't standards. So sometimes you have to go through a lot of training to be able to use them. And if we could standardize these, that would really help um, users to access the data. The second point was on communication with modelers and observa observation providers working more closely together, as has been stated a number of times by the other tables. Um, and that this would also lead to clear traceability so that you would know from the raw data through to whatever level of data you were using how it had been manipulated. Um, and we talked about how that could be provided along in the metadata with the data sets that you were accessing. And then the third point was that we really need global access for this data. Um, in the data sparse regions in the global south and the tropics, um, it's very difficult for scientists to access data for their regions. Uh, the free data is coarse and the high resolution data is expensive. Um, so we need sharing um, standards, sharing policies, and we need usage, usage policies to make all the data available to everybody globally. Um, and I think that's that. Perfect. So, just move on from the reporting back. Ooh. Okay, so um, so now we're going to have uh, the kind of take homes. We felt it would be very unfair to ask the session partners um, to immediately say how they're going to take some of these actions on board. But what we thought we could do was, was ask them what was a kind of really important take home or, or a nugget that they're taking home right now. And they're obviously going to reflect on everything that's harvested and the report and the evidence base that we then, then produce as a result of this. So I'll hand over now to Sabrina. So I would like to thank you for organizing this work cafe because it's a, a, a huge brainstorming between uh, many communities that goes from science to operational services, from observation of all kind to modelers. And it is uh, a dialogue that is very important to make progress in a moment that we really need a huge progress in our science and operation for accompanying humanities in what is the climate change today. Thank you. Super, thank you. I'll hand over then to Florian with his geo hat on. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this, what is really, really interesting to, to, to see today, this evening, but also in the, in the whole week, is that we, we have a deep dive into the, the science side of things, but then you have also to think about where the science is going to be used and how. So there is no easy side, there is no one hard science side <clears throat> and then a policy side where it's just, yes, we take it or we don't take it. I think having people from international conventions and multilateral agreements trying to bring together like 200 countries to agree on some common goals for the future is also something that is, should be also taken into account and things move fast, as you can see a couple of years ago, how many, how much hair I had on my head and now it's changing. So yeah, uh, let's consider that every side is well, way more complicated uh, than we, we think staying in our communities and let's, you know, with the science policy interface, trying to, to advance together. Thanks. And Suzanne. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the detailed discussions tonight. I learned a lot. Um, I think what I just realized is that we are really at a break point where many things are evolving. So as I said, as GCOS, as IPCC, we, we have all the lessons learned from those two um, evolving user requirements, but we also have this um, new climate initiative in ESA, which goes in a month's time to our member states um, to ask for their funding for our new ideas. And um, it's the right time for me to take all these messages home, um, which I think is actually quite exciting and because not often that many of those international things are aligning in time. 
Uh, so we have a good chance to um, take many of your um, suggestions on board, which I um, definitely do, um, and um, will include it in, in our implementation over the next years to come. So thank you. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And in terms of CMIP, uh, we're at a very good time to have this kind of brainstorming and getting all of these ideas of how, as we look forward to CMIP 7, we can really implement that co-development and co-creation right from the start across the communities. Um, so thank you very much for your energy at this time of night. I know it's been quite a long day um, and also your participation. And I would just 